Good Minnesota morning. Thank you everyone who braved it to come out for church this morning. Um, I was talking with Ron and Pastor Soli this morning that I, we remember, what, about 20, 25 years ago, we were told that we will always have church, and this proves it. There's always going to be someone who can get out and make it to church, and it's a good thing to see so many of you here today. Let's stand and sing our opening song, The Bells of Christmas, verses 1 through 4, number 298. The grace of the child born for us, the joy of the son given to us, be with you all. And also with you. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was God. In the Word was life. And the life was the life of all people. The Word became flesh and lived among us. The scripture song this morning is Word of God, Come Down on Earth. We will sing verse 1 in the ELW number 510. Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated, and this morning's scripture will be read by Jim Stern. A 
lesson this morning comes from uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. It goes as this. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob. Raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the furthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child, those in labor, together the great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations. I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd of flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice and dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them, and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. End of the lesson. We shall uh, read Psalm 147. I'll read the light, you read the dark. Worship the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Who has strengthened the bars of your gate and has blessed your children within you. God has established peace on your borders and satisfies you with the finest wheat. God sends out a command to the earth, a word that runs very swiftly. God gives snow like wool, scattering frost like ashes. God scatters hail like breadcrumbs. Who can stand against God's cold? The Lord sends forth the word and melts them. The wind, the wind blows and the waters flow. God declares the word to Jacob, statutes and judgments to Israel. The Lord has not done so to any other nation. They do not know God's judgments. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. As we just heard in the psalm, the word of the Lord is to melt us, the cold away. We hope that the, the gospel and that God's word will melt us. I'm going to read from a translation, uh, 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 a different translation for you. John 1 for the second Sunday in Christmas, John 1. Uh, verses 1 through 18. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him, nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. There once was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life he brings into light. He was in the world, the world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, 
generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, This is the one. The one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He has always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We live off generous bounty, gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and then this exuberant giving and receiving, this endless knowing and all understanding. All this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not as much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I grew up in Granite Falls, Minnesota, which is located right next to the Upper Sioux Indian Reservation. I grew up in a home where my mother didn't think very much of those people who lived on the reservation and as a result would say things about them that I would rather not repeat here in this sanctuary. But as a result of all of this, I grew up dismissing my Native American neighbors. They were people who were somehow beneath me, less than me. And I never dreamed that I would learn anything from one of them until I met Tony. Tony was a chemical dependency counselor at the Fergus Falls Regional Treatment Center. This is where I did my CPE, or clinical pastoral education. And I have to sadly confess, when I started there, I hardly noticed Tony. He talked about sweat lodges and stuff like that, and it just didn't interest me. I didn't hardly notice him. Well, our relationship changed later in that time when we both began working with a client who was named Ellen. Ellen was refusing treatment. Here we have a 50-year-old woman who did not believe she should be in treatment in the first place and had decided not to cooperate. It had reached a point with her that she wouldn't get out of bed. She wouldn't get dressed, never mind participating in the recovery group or the individual sessions that had been scheduled for her. And Tony and I had collaborated. We put our heads together to, to get a plan, help her open up, share some of those feelings that were caught inside of her. Even though she acted depressed, we were suspect that there was an immense anger underneath it all. But our plans as well as the attempts of the other counselors and clinicians, had all failed. And at one of our meetings, we were talking about moving her to a different facility, about giving up. Well, the next day, Tony came to me, caught me in the hall, and he said, it came to me last night, something I learned a long time ago. When you feel like giving up, that's what the other person is feeling, too. Then he went on. We're about to give up on Ellen. I think she is on the edge of giving up and giving in. Well, I'd never thought of it that way before. So when we went over Ellen's case in the, the next staff meeting, we decided not to give up on her, but to hang in there. In the end, it turned out to be a turning point for Ellen. It was the beginning of healing for her. It wasn't pretty, that's for sure. But Tony, that Native American, that Indian, had been right. And I began to uh, think a little bit more seriously about this man. And as I got to know him, 
I learned a lot from Tony. Once he reflected on his own experience growing up on a reservation, he said, in order to hate someone, to be able to attack someone, you first had to make them less of a person. I said, I wasn't real sure what he meant by this, and then he went on to tell how he and his gang would get ready to fight another gang. Prior to the fight, they would go through this process, this gang, where they would call the other people ugly names, derogatory stuff. They'd group them together as an enemy. And Tony said, when we destroyed their individuality, then we were ready to fight them. I thought about those Indians on the reservation back in Granite Falls. I hadn't taken time to get to know any of them individually. I had grouped them together, called them ignorant, dirty, poor. I hadn't fought them, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with them. Now, many years later, as I reflect on this, I, I think this must be some sort of natural tendency of the human race. That is to put individuals into a group, and then once we've got them into a group, we label them according to race or income or ability, where they live, what they do, what kind of grades they get, what they wear, or so on. And once that group has the label, and they've lost their individuality, we're better able to ignore them, reject them, exclude them, criticize them, or even attack them. And we know this isn't fair. We know this isn't right because we know we can, could do and we should do better, but we know this because each of us, I think, has found ourselves grouped and judged by others. I'm part of the pastor group. I, I wear that, that sign, I'm a pastor. It's not a negative thing at all. But when it means that somebody assumes I'm like every other pastor, it doesn't feel so good. A label can become negative when people make assumptions about us without even getting to know us. Yes, I'm a pastor, but I'm an individual. I'm unlike anyone else just as you're unlike anyone else in your group. I wonder what group do you get stuck in? Maybe you're in the senior citizen group and you feel others don't know you as a person, they just think of you as an old person, sort of slow and like to tell the same story over and over again. Or maybe you're in a high school group. And people assume you're just like all the other kids and they don't know you individually. We all want to and we need to be known for who we are. We need to be known for our complexity. We want to be known completely. And we don't want to be mistaken for someone we're not. I think there was a fear of being misunderstood, mistaken, or ultimately rejected that was part of this dynamic with Ellen and her anger. She didn't want anyone to see her anger. She was afraid. People fight, people ignore each other, not wanting to take the time to get to know each other, not wanting to work out the relationship and the complexity and anger and feelings and all those other things. But friends, God created us to be in relationship with each other. He gave us the tools we need to get to know each other. And he tells us, love one another. Don't fight. Don't ignore each other. Our gospel points to how difficult this is for us. Scripture says that God created us, but we didn't even recognize or notice our creator. Our creator God comes in the person of Jesus. We didn't have room for him anywhere. Worse than not recognizing him, we totally rejected him, and Jesus was put to death. 
if we try to analyze this a little bit, we see that Jesus was identified as a dissident. He was a traitor. He was gooped with those that were against the church of his day. He's made into something those religious leaders could ultimately hate and reject. But we know Jesus is a person, a man who was flesh and blood, who laughed and cried, one who had family and friends who bled when he was caught and he died when he was crucified. This is Jesus the man, but we also know Jesus as God, the one we cannot begin to comprehend or to see. God who's greater than all things, infinite, all-powerful, the light, the glory of the Father in heaven. And we're invited to know this Jesus, to be in relationship with him. So how is it that we do this? How do we get to know one another? Well, we spend time together. We listen to each other. We ask questions. We eat together. We share stories. And eventually we get to know that other person as an individual, and that person gets to know us. It takes time. It requires us to let go of our natural tendency to group and label people. Well, that's how we get to know Jesus. That's how we get to know God, spending time with him, asking questions, listening to stories, studying, hearing what other people's experience are of that. But there's an additional factor in this getting to know God. It's an important additional factor. We begin in our relationship with God acknowledging that God already knows us. God already knows us. He created us. He knows us completely. We can't tell him anything that we, he doesn't already know. Well, this could be a frightening thought. We have nowhere to hide from God. God has the power to accept or re reject us. But when we come before Jesus, we meet the one whose love has no end, the one who never gives up on us, even when we feel like giving up, the one who knows us completely, and we have nothing to fear in Jesus. He's even willing to be rejected by us, and still he loves us. Sin fills this world, certainly, and sin can keep us apart, and sin can make us ignorant or fight others. Sin can cause us to reject the love of God, but sin will never stop God from loving us, from loving you and me. This second Sunday, in Christmas, we're invited to the manger to see Jesus and to believe. And it's through believing we become children of God, making us brothers and sisters. Even when we're as different as one living on an Indian reservation and the other being white and living in town, we are members of God's family. Let us know God and grow to know one another. Believing in Christ, we become children of God and we live together in peace. Amen. The hymn we're going to sing is at 250, 285, is a Christmas hymn you've never heard before. Jean told me I'd be the only one singing it <laughs> because it's unfamiliar. But it's such a beautiful hymn, uh, I'd want you to sing along with me, but I'll leave my microphone on, and uh, it's three verses. Uh, let's sing it together. <laughs>
days and night when angels clove the sky with song and light and God embodied love and sheath his might who could but grasp Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, therefore let us be reconciled to God and to one another. God of grace, we confess before you that we have wandered from your presence to seek the false security of other gods around us. We often look for you in strongholds of power and wealth and do not see your presence among the ordinary places of our world. Forgive us, O Lord, and redirect us forms of service that fulfill your desire for us. Out of God's great mercy, 
Jesus Christ took on our humanity and from the same love made flesh, we are given forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we include special petitions on behalf of those who are uh, dealing with uh, ongoing illness and difficulty. Shannon Royce, Jan Helfritz, Bill Niebuhr, Carolyn Tachi, Stu Fullerton, Kathy Goldman. We also include prayers for Milt Peterson, who has uh, been taken to the hospital in Mankato. For Carrie Eastman, niece to Barb uh, Fox, for cancer surgery. Elaine Hartshorn, sister to Barb Fox, for healing. And to the families of June Cedorf Harrison, who passed away. Uh, she was living in Colorado. She's a sister to Mark and Evan Seedorf, and to the family's family of Eileen Batty, she's the mother of Jeff Batty. Her funeral was Thursday in New Richland. In joy and in wonder, we pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. We give you thanks, O Lord, that you would come to live among your people. Fill the church with your wisdom. Guide us in the ways of righteousness, that we may show others the witness of your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Shine your light through this faith community into the wider community. Bless the work of missionaries Karen Anderson and the Lofstroms. Sustain the Lutheran ministries in Colombia and in Tanzania. We also ask that you would bless the congregation's new Wednesday night meal and worship. May our ministry be a beacon for all who hunger and thirst for righteousness and who are in need of mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would journey with all refugees and displaced peoples. We especially ask that you would accompany the refugees in South Sudan. Keep them from harm. Lead them in safety to place where they will find security, that they might rejoice in the care you have provided them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you are a sure, de sure defense to all whose lives are threatened by pain, personal crisis, illness, injury, or persistent fear. We lift up to you today our sisters Shannon, Jan, Carolyn, Kathy, Carrie, and Elaine, and our brothers Bill, Stu, and Milt, and those we name silently in our hearts. Give all shelter from hardship, rest when they are weary. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give thanks for the saints that now dwell with you in the fullness of your kingdom. We remember before you June and Eileen. We ask that you would surround their family and loved ones with the hope of eternal life that we have in you. Keep us all faithful to your truth revealed in Christ until you make all things new. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we entrust to you all for whom we pray, confident that you fulfill your promises through Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is a little bit of the flu season, so if you don't want to shake hands or touch, just keep your hands to yourself. But the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let us share the peace. That's peace.
We will continue our worship as we receive our tithes and offerings. Peace. Please stand for the offering prayer. God of time and eternity, you have, you have given, given your, your only Son, born, born of Mary, to, to save and redeem us. us. Receive, Receive now these gifts that we bring, and let, let our works of our hands proclaim the news of your redeeming love. In Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we will be serving con uh, communion continuously on the floor or at the rail. So we have three stations if you'd like to come to the rail. I believe you, you pick up a glass and then just come on up and then you go off to the side and there'll be a place for your, for your empty. Come, all is ready.
The songs during the distribution will be numbers 283 and 275 found in the ELW.
May this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in faith, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. We'll have a, a couple of announcements before we have a blessing and uh, sing our closing song. To grab my, my notes here. I think I made some notes. It's good to be back. I was gone last Sunday. We had a family gathering. Uh, I think there were probably about 25 of us solis. It's a dangerous sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, all at my sister's in the Twin Cities. So I appreciate being able to have a weekend off. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Joel. Next Sunday, on the 12th, you will get to meet Pastor uh, Lori Steger. And I will be over at Mido Lutheran, uh, taking her, her pulpit while she comes here uh, to, to, to meet you all and uh, to, to, uh, to be part of it. You can come on Wednesday night or send your friends and family members on, on Wednesday. Uh, Lori will be part of that, that service on Wednesday as well. And it's also an opportunity to have a meal together and get to know each other even better. So Wednesday night, uh, we will be having our first of hopefully a, a, a long season of meals and worship and uh, uh, some education. Their programming will have to develop around that. Uh, you notice that the, the, the doors are open here. Uh, part of our service on Wednesday night will be prayer around the cross. The cross is in place. You will see on Wednesday, if you were to come, uh, places for candles and, and prayers. That will be a part of, part of our service. We'll be using on Wednesdays the scripture uh, from the Sunday. So our scripture for today will be uh, used uh, on, the, on, the, on the Wednesday. There will be a, a sermon. It will be a, a sort of a, a small sermon. What do you call that? A good deal? Condensed. Oh, condensed. <laughs> so, I didn't think you said a, no. <laughs> so uh, this this weather is playing uh, havoc with our our plans. We decided on. Friday, as the wind was blowing and they were canceling school for the world on, on Monday, that it probably would be better not to have our live Epiphany celebration this, this afternoon. Uh, and keep people at home. I, th I don't think it's going to warm up. <laughs> I think it's supposed to get worse, if anything. Uh, so I'm going to be looking for a time to reschedule that. We'll have Epiphany on a warmer day, maybe. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you for being being flexible on that. And also, I talked to uh, Brad Hagen yesterday about our our uh, Monday night uh, uh, team meetings, and decided we should move those to Thursday night. Uh, it might won't be a perfect uh, solution, but rather than coming out tomorrow night when it, when the mercury is really dropping, we're just not going to do that. We will get together on Wednesday at 6, and I'll send out an email to that effect. I think I've got most of the, those people's emails, but pass, pass the word. So those two weather-related weather, weather -related announcements. Oh, it's winter, and it's a wonderland, isn't it? That's a good, good segue, right? I'm here just to put a face and a voice to the Winter Wonderland that is uh, scheduled for Sunday, January 26th. Last year, the uh, outreach uh, fellowship uh, team, ministry team, did celebrate love in February, where we had a great meal and uh, played the newlywed game with three fun couples. We're doing something similar this year um, on Sunday, January 26th, we're going to have what's called Winter Wonderland, and there's uh, an entry in your bulletin. Uh, it's an opportunity to enjoy a great meal, 
and my wife had some fancy words by these things. To me, we're going to have a salad, a fancy salad, uh, a grilled pork loin, some fancy potatoes, a uh, fancy vegetable, and dessert. So if you want more details, talk to the ladies, because they'll give you that. <laughs> um, it'll be a night of fellowship and visiting. The entertainment this year will be Family Feud. So instead of the newlywed game, we'll do Family Feud. And not everybody that comes will be involved, so don't panic. But we do need, we would like to get four teams of four or five members of a team. And they don't have to be all family members. It could be um, the golfers versus the quilters. Or uh, love circle versus the church staff or the adult choir versus the back of the church family. <laughs> Whatever it is, get four or five people together and come and have, just come and have some fun and watch other people make fools of them. No, no, entertain you. Thank you. Um, details are pretty much in here, but in, come and enjoy. They're trying to, we're trying to figure out how many to, to prepare for it. That's part of it. So there's a sign up on the, on the door. And as much as I preach about peace, feuding is okay. So all in good fun. Those are the announcements, unless somebody else has, has one, or did I forget anything? All right. I invite you to stand for a blessing, and then we will sing together. Let us bless the Lord. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of Christ, child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending song is the first Noel. It's number 300 in the ELW.